Okay, very cool. Um, I, I, I'm seeing a live video of my face, but icons are names for everybody else. If I click on stop video, then I no longer see you guys. Um, uh, how do I turn myself into an icon like you guys are, but while still being able to see the display of everybody else? I think you can, um, there was, a, there was an option to hide your own videos somewhere. There are too many options. That's the only problem they have. Okay. Uh, video. Um, yeah, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> now I see a live video of Alex. Yeah, I guess that, that makes it a little bit more, uh, Um, maybe you want to unpin your video. What does that mean? So if your video is taking the entire screen, um, you will probably find an unpin button on the top left corner of that video. Uh, are you in, um, do you see a button saying speaker view or gallery view? Gallery view, yeah. All right, so. Um, ah, speaker view. But then um, you want to make sure that no video is pinned. Uh, I don't know. So I don't know what Spotlight video does. I'm going to try that with you, Alex. Let's see what happens. I just made you uh, the spotlight of our video. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I'm going to cancel that. Um, so I'm going to turn on my, but like I'm not really turning on my camera. It seems let's... like a really bad beta test. Um, yeah, but the nice thing is I'm 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 not the one who wrote the code, right? So I'm like, I mean. usually <laughs> when it's me. What right? I mean is, I mean, like this should have uh, should have been dry run some time ago. Um, yeah. So it's just that uh, with Zoom there are too many uh, moving parts. That, <laughs> I'm just know. gonna jump into the uh, into the old Hangout for a bit. Uh, Mark on, on, on another computer to see if anybody accidentally went to the old one. Oh, that's a good that's a good idea. See if anybody showed up in the old place. Let them know about the new place. Yeah, and as soon as we get past, past all, uh, hi Daria. As soon as we get past all of these um, uh, uh, issues, these um, uh, new Zoom experience issues, uh, Michael, today's your day. You get to tell us about uh, uh, Jessica and Met Interpreting Jesse. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'll just wait for Alex to come back. Okay. I'm still here. Oh. I'm just I'm just switching over to my Linux system. Did you find anybody? Uh, that's not. Hang on a second. That's the wrong link. So um, just a quick uh, intro, um, uh, like the weird things about Zoom, uh, like any other thing, uh, but especially here. Um, you, you have a toolbar at the bottom of the window, um, and there's manage participants and uh, chat. Um, those two, I, I often have them open. Um, it, you know, chat, you can do uh, chat to everyone or individually. Um, so make sure the to field is not like privately at someone if you're trying to tell everyone something. Um, it tends to be sometimes the case. Um, 
and then you, you can emote, um, you know, to encourage the speaking person to shift gears or to disapprove, approve, all these things are in the um, toolbar and manage participants for some reason. Um, and you can even go get coffee, I guess. Okay. All right, um, there's nobody in the other meeting room, so. Okay, good. Um, and uh, hi, Dan. Uh, since you're the most recent to join, let me just verify with you that when you joined, it did inform you that we are recording. It did, yes. Excellent. Okay, uh, Michael, I think we are uh, ready. You probably want to project your screen if you can figure out how to do that. Excellent. Is that big enough or should I zoom in a bit? Aha, uh -huh. no pun intended. Right. Um, That's think, fine. Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. That's, that is better actually, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I was just gonna step through the, the points that I made in the email, uh, just to demonstrate each of the things that I remember to do. Um, so the first thing was, uh, there's been a lot of work that I did on the, the quasi-peg interpreter, um, which is the parser expression generator, grammar generator. Um, Essentially, the main changes that I've made from how quasi-peg generator worked, the way you had it, Mark, mm -hmm. is uh, there's now explicit white space rules, and there's a skip token. So you can, re you can return a skip from something. I'll show you how that looks in quasi-peg. Oh, okay, here we have it. So, uh, for a given grammar here, we have underscore tokens that are just by convention tokens that get skipped by the uh, semantic actions. So when I say a grammar is underscore spacing definition plus end of file, I can just pass that directly to metacompile, which takes the definitions as arguments. Okay, so the so it's not just um, what, so so when you said it's a convention, does the quasi does the quasi parser generator, the quasi peg generator, understand the underbar? This oh, is I exactly see. what makes it work. So I if, see. If so you, the, I see. The skip is the magic. The skip is the magic that means omit it from the argument list yes. of the uh, production naming this thing. That's right. Okay. So if you have something like this question, which is playing followed by underscore spacing, then that will just return a question to the, to the okay. caller. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, since this, um, uh, both the people uh, that are uh, in the meeting live and the people watching the recording, uh, you should assume that, um, uh, that generally people do not know my quasi parser generator. Okay. Um, so just go ahead and take things from the top. Sure, okay. So I'll start off with the test suite, which is okay. the best way to start. Um, so I have some tests written in Node.js running in TypeScript. Uh, and I'll get to TypeScript later, but if I start with uh, json.ts, um, you'll see that there's a boot peg and a peg st, that's just how you make the first peg tag. And then we call make a JSON tag. So these tags are created from the definitions in lib, where we have quasi parsers for each of these things. Okay. So, uh, the, quasi so I, the, the, the TS is for TypeScript. Yes. Uh, um, uh, so I have never actually used TypeScript. I can um, go straight to the MJSs too. That works just as well. Uh, I would prefer that just to, to have one less concept that I need to, to think about. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> the peg tag itself defines the grammar for peg tags. That's how this all starts off. So mm -hmm. basically a, a, a peg tag is a quick quest. Uh, could you sure. um, collapse your explorer oh, yes. on the left side? Definitely. Okay. And um, I'm not sure how much that helped. I was hoping to have it all. Never mind. Go on. OK. 
Okay, what I don't know what you can actually see of my screen right now. Should I make this big maybe? Does that help? Uh, I, was, I was I thought it was word wrapped and it wasn't. So. Okay, yeah. Um uh, yeah, uh, keep it a little bit zoomed in, please. Just a little bit more. Like if I do uh, no, like I mean scaling wise. Uh, no, no, the other view was better. It was taking the full uh, video width. Okay. But yeah, if you zoom uh, VS Code's uh, font size, yeah, perfect. Okay, okay, good, good. Uh, so to give the meta circular definition here, the the peg tag is a tag template that accepts a template string that describes a grammar. So this peg tag is parsing this definition of a grammar, which in this file, this grammar happens to define the grammar that peg tags accept. So this is how the system all gets bootstrapped, is there's a, an AST that's generated from this, and then that is compiled into a peg, peg tag. Um, to avoid infinite regress, the AST that we supply to the bootstrap is just handwritten or generated by the parser earlier. Uh, so the peg tag basically takes these productions that describe parsing expression grammars. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a similar thing to uh, BNF, except it has prioritized choice. Uh, so when you express uh, multiple choices, like in this prefix rule, um, the slashes indicate try the first one first, then the second one, then the third one, and the fourth, if they all fail. Um, so these, these holes that we have in the template name functions that are the semantic actions for each of these rules. So for this rule, or, or for this uh, sequence and hole, we get this function called when it parses correctly and has committed. So the first argument is the token for, or the, the semantic action for and, and the second argument is the semantic action for the whole. And then we're generating a parse tree out of that. So we say it's a, pred, a predicate followed by the whole number, which is what we got from the whole token. Um, so I'd love to make this more of a conversation. So uh, feel free to ask the things I should clarify more. Yeah. So uh, what is what? Uh, so and uh, um, uh, what is the actual token that and names? So and is way down here. That's where I stuffed all my tokens. And and is simply the ampersand with the okay. expressing. So, uh, I take it there are no bitwise operations in this language. No, it's it's exclusively for bootstrapping the parsing language itself. So, where we move on to something like JSON or Jesse, they're written in this language. The grammars are written in this language, but then they themselves handle uh, grammars that include bitwise operations and stuff like that. So this is all very clearly documented at the top here, where we have, this is the source that uh, okay. Marta made for his parsing expression grammar uh, interface that was basically a C compiler like uh, Yak or Bison. Okay. Um, so I'll move on to the uh, grammar that's implemented in the peg, namely JSON. Okay. So JSON, this syntax here is still the peg syntax, but this grammar is not parsing a peg, it's parsing a JSON expression. Mm -hmm. So this is taken uh, quite literally from the JSON specification, um, just what they allow. And uh, yeah, so we can get to... Um, so as an example, a definition of array is left bracket or right bracket. All my tokens have implicit trailing white space. Uh, 
or a kind of explicit trailing white space that we define a left bracket with trailing white space and so on. So the WS token is the token we use for all of these grammars based on JSON. So let me let me uh, uh, just mention some things that I'm seeing that are familiar to, to help uh, fill in some of the context. Is the JSON grammar is written the way it is uh, in order to be a super grammar, a grammar to be inherited from, in order for subgrammars to extend this grammar uh, into successively larger subsets of JavaScript. So that's what the comment to be extended on primary expression is and why it's called primary expression is that this is the subset of what becomes primary expression as we grow from JSON into larger subsets of JavaScript. Yes, and that should be more familiar to people who are familiar with the JavaScript grammar as in the standard. Mm -hmm. So these grammars were actually inherited almost directly from Mark's earlier work on uh, parsing expression or parsing quasi parser generator and uh, the grammars he was writing for Jesse and, and so on. I have a question about lines 31 and 32. Sure. So in line 32, you're using the star star and not the plus plus uh, to just uh, fill in uh, for, for everybody else. Oh. Um, uh, one of the the uh, things that um, uh, Dean came up with, Dean, by the way, just joined us. One, uh, of, one of the things that Dean came up with in some much earlier um, uh, extended BNF uh, exercise was um, uh, uh, normal uh, regexps and extended BNF have a suffix star and plus and question mark. Uh, Dean came up with the uh, infix star star and plus plus, uh, meaning, um, uh, let's say in this case, uh, element star star comma means uh, zero or more elements separated by commas. Ah, okay. And then the, uh, the semantic value of the star star uh, is the list of, left, of semantic values of the left hand operand, i.e. the list of semantic values of the successive uh, element productions in this case. Uh, the question I have about 31 versus 32 is uh, if you had said plus plus rather than, than star star, that would mean one or more elements separated by commas. Since you said star star, it means zero or more elements separated by commas. So it would seem to me that 31 is redundant. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And this was a misunderstanding on my basis. Um, I guess I would have to check to see if the returned array for the expression designated by the star star um, is empty and then just elided if it is. Okay. Um, for clarification, ES here would be the elements? Yes, so starting from left to right, uh, this is the first underscore over here left bracket, and then the second underscore is element star star comma, which yeah. returns all the elements. Makes sense, all right, perfect, thanks. Okay. This is the same on line 39 and 40. Yeah, exactly, okay. I'll make a brief note of that, just so I don't forget it. Okay, good. Oh, and uh, since all arguments about language syntax uh, always start out with uh, white space and indentation, I'm um, <laughs> uh, just going to, to, to comment on lines uh, 39 and 40 that um, uh, the, uh, it, both, both alternatives that start with left brace are with are, are subsidiary to the record, but the way in which it's spaced out doesn't look that way. Uh, whereas on lines 30 through 32, it does look. Um, so if, if, if 39 and 40 had been 
Um, oh, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Invented like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good, good, much better. Okay. So um, also a clarification here. Um, the uh, 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 an inset that you have, the white space inset versus the, uh, you have, a, um, I guess this is a backslash or a forward slash? It's forward slash, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so aligning them, is it aesthetic only or is it um, uh, related to the syntax of, of the, you know, the definition that you're, so, so if, if you remove the spaces on line 40, the, you know, um, prefixed spaces or the spaces yeah. before, would um, that actually affect how, how uh, like the meaning of? No, uh, the peg grammar is, uh, is not white space dependent, so. Okay, perfect. So you'll notice each of these rules is actually terminated by a semicolon, even if it appears after the semantic action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that semicolon is what tells it that the rule is over. Yeah. So just, yeah, one of the, th another thing to fill in for people who are used to um, non-PEG parser generators uh, is uh, this is a, the reason why this thing explicitly has things like underbar white space on the tokens uh, is that this is a one level grammar um, uh, in that it's not, doesn't have a separate lexer versus parser. Uh, you know, uh, for for sort of normal practice outside of pegs, so you have a like with yak, you have a two-level grammar where you've got a lexer that uh, gives you a stream of tokens where the lexer um, defines the white white space insensitivity and tosses you know and and uh, does not uh, produce any white space information up to the parser, and then the parser just sees a sequence of tokens. Uh, with the peg here, uh, the peg is really just seeing a sequence of characters and it's one grammar that's trying to get all the way up from the characters to the AST. So the white space rules are part of the one level grammar. So here's some interesting stuff uh, down near the bottom. We have the definition of UTF-8 that's accepted by Jason. So this is a, a UTF-8 character. Uh, with continuations. So essentially, it defines the the uh, extended UTF-8 characters, whether it has a two, three, or, or four characters. Uh, not characters, sorry, bytes, I will say. Nice. Um, so I don't, I don't understand what I'm looking, let's just start with the backslash 302 at the beginning of line 74. So in, uh, in the, the peg grammar, uh, it accepts octal esca escapes as oh, classes. Please, no, 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 not octal. Please, no octal. <laughs> this is the only time you'll ever see it. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want to ever see it anywhere ever. Um, uh, one of the things that we did in uh, ECMAScript strict is ECMAScript strict is actually specified to reject octal. Mm -hmm. uh, a string literal that contains an octal escape is statically reject causes the program to be statically rejected. That's fine. Yeah. 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 Uh, backslash u followed by hex is good. Okay. I'll I'll extend the parser grammar to do that. Okay. <clears throat> and ideally eliminate the octal. It's just one of those historical combat. You know. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, octal should simply not be accepted. Dead. So. Uh, Ian Piamarto, on, on whose grammar this was based, simply loved Octal because he's a C programmer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every other language has gotten over it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will make a note of that. Mm -hmm. So I only ever encountered Octals uh, working uh, on PostScript code. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so, and, and I, I studied typography and we like studied fonts, like we dissected everything about what fonts are and Unicode. Um, but I've never ever seen Octal in code I worked on. So, <laughs> yeah. You you can, it will be gone by the next couple of days. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I see, I see on lines 80 through 83 that you do actually define the backslash U followed by four hex characters. Yes. Uh, syntax as well as without the U. Uh, so yeah, so just getting rid of the second one. Another little historical second, note. 
Uh, you mean this one here? Yeah, exactly. This actually is a negative look ahead. So it says anything that's not a, a backslash and then matches a character of uh, 32. Well, this oh, one. oh, oh, oh. So this says any escaped you or any escaped character at all, which are the BFN RT. Oh, I see. And then we reject anything that doesn't begin with a, a backslash unless it's within the range of, our, of UTF-8. Uh, clarification, if I may. Uh, Certainly. I'm wondering if you have uh, support for backslash X, XX. Uh, it's not in the JSON grammar, my understanding. Um, I'm not sure if it should be added in Justin, perhaps. Well, if it's not part of the grammar, then, then no. I mean, you're writing a JSON parser. Don't violate the spec. The, 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 just to, to, to fill in, what Michael said was uh, he doesn't know if it should be in Justin. We haven't talked about Justin yet. So the, the, the hierarchies of extensions is JSON is the base grammar, the, the, super, you know, the, the smallest grammar in terms of the success of subsets. Uh, and yeah, it should, it should not have backslash X because it's not part of JSON. Uh, uh, Justin is a um, uh, superset of JSON and subset of Jesse, which is essentially the um, uh, JavaScript expression grammar that does not contain functions, does not contain declarations, just contains uh, JavaScript expressions. Um, so uh, we can, so it is an open question as to um, uh, what we should and should not include in Justin that's part of the JavaScript expression grammar that we want Justin to include. So that's a, that's a policy decision we can revisit when we take it, when we get, come back to looking at Justin. Uh, okay. but, but yes, it should, backslash X should not be part of JSON. Can I ask a question here? Uh, it's very relevant. Um, so um, does Justin have the regular expression grammars? No. No. OK. Uh, so I think as soon as you introduce um, regex patterns as a grammar, um, um, I, the um, um, hex uh, escape should, uh, should be part of it, because a lot of the grammars um, a lot of the code using regex um, simplifies with um, with the hex when it's less than um, when it doesn't qualify for uh, you know it's a short number. Okay, so we are we actually don't so the 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 successive subsets are uh, Jason is the smallest, then Justin, then Jesse, uh, and that's all that I was trying to do. Uh, accurately using um, uh, the quasi the quasi parser generator. Uh, so um, I'm going to assume that's all you're trying to do accurately as well. And then uh, SES is really um, based on the full uh, grammar of JavaScript, which I was not trying to uh, represent um, uh, with these techniques. And the reason is that JavaScript is bizarrely hard to parse. And to parse JavaScript accurately um, and to lex JavaScript accurately uh, requires weird context dependence, which is not natural to um, uh, uh, BNF. And how natural it is to uh, pegs, I'm not sure, but, but it's beyond my goals for for, for what we're trying to do here. Um, I do, um, uh, uh, so in particular, uh, the JavaScript grammar um, uh, has parameterized lexical productions and parameterized parser productions to deal with uh, um, uh, lexing ambiguities and semicolon insertion rules. Uh, all of which are absent from Jesse. In order for them to be absent from Jesse, uh, I needed to, uh, I needed to, and I decided to omit the regexp uh, lexical grammar from Jesse because the regexp lexical grammar 
requires you to know what to do when you see a, a slash. Uh, the slash could be the beginning of a regexp, or it could be a beginning of a slash slash or a slash star comment, or it could be a divide. And in the presence of semicolon insertion, uh, it becomes bizarrely hard to know how to interpret the slash. So by omitting, by choosing a bunch of things to omit from Jesse, I was able to have Jesse be a proper subset of JavaScript and still not have to worry about parameterized productions. Um, yes. Uh, sorry, there is a point I'll just add here, and I'm going to try to plug something I worked on. Uh, I've refined a regular expression that, if matched in the right sequence when you're matching uh, the different tokens, uh, it actually matches a regular expression. So as long as you're not in a string, and as long as you ma uh, match um, the regular expression, I believe, before or after commas, it matches, so far, every single regular expression. So but how do you know that you're that you should? I mean, remember that we're trying to be a subset of JavaScript. Yeah. So uh, the JavaScript, if the JavaScript, if the code interpreted as JavaScript, would have interpreted the slash, not as the beginning of a regular expression, but as a a, a divide or the beginning of a slash slash or slash star comment, perhaps with semicolon insertion then um, you shouldn't successfully interpret it as something else. In order to be a subset, you either need to reject or you need to interpret it the same way as a full JavaScript would interpret it. Um, so, so how it works for me is that I, um, I guard based on the uh, following expression. Sorry, one second. So I check after the regular expression. Um, and I know that the grammar is not defined by looking after. Uh, but I actually have conditions for what can mm -hmm. follow. Uh, sorry, someone's at the door. Um, we, we, we can pick this up afterwards. OK. OK, so this is the Justin grammar that Mark alluded to earlier. So in the, each of these cases, um, the endowments that we passed in to make Justin <clears throat> or the peg tag that we generated and the, the previous JSON peg. So this is what uses the peg extend syntax, which uh, generates a new quasi quasi uh, literal tag that is the peg grammar extended by the existing grammar in the JSON tag, if that makes sense. So we're saying that all the rules from JSONPEG are added, and we can override them or inherit them. Like here we use super.string, which is the JSON definition of a string as one of the alternatives. Uh, and then we can extend the string definition with our, our new single quoted definition. Good. Do you have any extension scenarios where the super.string is not first, where the super call is not first? Yes, absolutely. That does happen. Uh, and it's all based on what priorities you need. So if you have to do something that's ambiguous in the previous grammar, uh, you have to prioritize your insertions above the ones that are the superset. Mm -hmm. So uh, here, this also demonstrates one other extension from Ian, which is the less than and greater than. Uh, this brackets a number of tokens or expressions and basically, the entire consumed string by those tokens or expressions are what's returned to the semantic action. I did not understand that. OK, so uh, to decompress this statement, so I'm looking for a, a single quote. And then I'm looking for anything that is not a single quote, followed by, uh, and if it is not a single quote, then the matches of the character rule, which includes the escape characters and backslashes and so on. Okay. And I want zero more of those, and then followed by another single quote. The, the less than and greater than uh, are basically like YY text, where you say, this is 
for my semantic action, I'm not interested in the individual list of characters. I'm not interested in the single quotes. I just want to know what string was consumed by this. Okay. So the semantic action then calls transform single quote, which uh, basically rewrites the single quote interior into a double quote interior and then calls JSON parse on it. Ah, cool. Uh, just a nit, if I may. Certainly. Uh, line 67, you refer to these as JavaScript style comments. Um, wouldn't they technically be C style comments? <laughs> or C++? Plus? Well, I'm, I, I know it's a nit. But I'm just <laughs> no, no, from <laughs> um, Algo. <laughs> they're not Algo. They're C++, I guess. Yeah. So, um, Actually, I think so, calling them JavaScript style is actually the right thing. Yeah, um, since we're defining this in terms of successive subsets of JavaScript, uh, the fact that these conform to, a, you know, that these are within JavaScript is actually the ger germane issue. Um, in, uh, I think the commenting rules for slash slash and slash star are the same between JavaScript and C++. Um, but the 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 fact they that are. they're that they're, that they're conforming to JavaScript is the relevant issue. Uh, so something that uh, I was able to refine some of the grammars that Mark had written, uh, where basically the negative look ahead saves our day in a lot of places. Um, it allows us to define things like the no new line rule where we say, if it's not an identifier, so we look and check if it's an identifier. If it's not an identifier and it matches space or tab, then it's a, it's a white space that doesn't contain a new line. Say that again. Okay, so the negative look ahead says, try the ident rule. If it succeeds, fail. Okay. And if it fails, don't do anything, just go back to where you were okay. and then try the next next set of expressions or tokens. So this, this looks at the character class of spaces and tabs and says zero or more spaces or tabs, as long as it didn't match an identifier, are considered uh, to be How could, a line. I don't understand. How could, uh, why, why is identifier, what is the purpose of identifier here? Because if we have uh, an expression or an identifier followed by uh, open parenthesis, for example, then this mm -hmm. rule should match if we're at the open parenthesis. It's oh, that's a star. Yeah, that's a star. star. If yeah. it was a plus, you wouldn't need the identifier. But that's otherwise, right. no new line would match between every oh. construct. Yeah, exactly. Because it would just match every string. Uh. And so you'd have a success, even though that was not. Wait a second. So, so what about um, non-identifier multi-character tokens like plus plus? Uh, so we're assuming if we get something like that, because it's a token, we have another rule that matches it. But when we're specifically looking for new, no new line, say between async and await, or async and uh, generator, or async and function, for example, we only care that it's only white space. But what this doesn't cover yet, and this is imperfect still, is uh, you should be able to insert comments and stuff in that, in that situation. So let me ask, is another way to phrase the no new line, that's for use when you require some white space? Is that correct? If you require some white space, you can match it against white space as well. Okay. This is for the case where you have to know that at least there is no new line in between the two tokens. Yeah. So let, let's let's go through a, co a concrete example. Uh, sure. In JavaScript grammar, um, you cannot say return new line three semicolon. Um, okay. So this is where we use that. Okay. So if we had return open parenthesis, then it would skip over the no new line because that's a zero or more match and go straight into the expression. Okay. Uh, but if we had return space expression, that would work too. 
Okay. So if I return new line something else, then this no new line would fail. Because there's nothing else that's that can be after the return token and before the expression. So um, so how does the no identifier play into this example? What if we if we had removed no identifier from the no new line rule, how would how would uh, the rule on 115 misbehave. If you type the word returns, then that would parse as return followed by the expression S. Got it. Okay. 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 So it has to do with the, um, the tokenization. Basically, it's because we're not tokenizing separately mm -hmm. that we have to worry about one identifier being a prefix of a longer identifier. Yes. Got it. Uh, and to make that clear too, the convention is that for all the white space, it's introduced into the tokens as trailing white space all the time. So for a given token, we can always assume we're not at white space and we can just match a, a, a fixed string. But then when we define all our other tokens, we need to insert white space explicitly. So this rule on 116 illustrates that, where we want return and then explicit white space or none followed by the okay. semicolon. Okay. Okay. <sighs> yeah, similar. Things you can do that are slightly fancier, but yes, that's nice. I think mm -hmm. That works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and under bar WS, that does include new line. It does, yes. And it also includes uh, comments and end of line comments. So okay. I should be extending no new line to say if it's an embedded multi-line comment, then that should also match the rule. Yeah, what does the no new line rule in JavaScript do with a line comment as opposed to a you know slash slash comment rather than a slash oh, star comment? Good question. <laughs> okay, I yeah, guess I what agree. I do or what it should do. <laughs> I, well, the yeah, um, since I don't know what it what it's specified to do, we can skip it for now. But let's let's remember to investigate at some point. Okay, I'll make and a note. If I remember correctly, um, the the single line comment does not include the line terminator. Ah, so you can have a line comment at a, where a no new line appears in the grammar. You should be able to. Uh, so in, per in uh, particular, return slash slash foo new line three semicolon should be accepted by the JavaScript grammar. It would, it would be accepted, but it would return undefined because the, the, the tokenization of that would look like the return keyword followed by a comment, followed by a line terminator, which ends oh. the return statement. Oh, oh you're it. saying that the line, that the, the slash slash foo new line, the new line. Yeah, the comment does not consume the new line. It does like, not consume the new line. Okay, right. I, I misunderstood. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay, so I'll, I um, added that to my notes and I can revisit that when we're refining this. Okay, uh, just as long as we're on this topic, let me just for completeness, uh, return slash star uh, foo new line star slash three semicolon should be okay because the new line is the only new line in question is between the slash star and the star slash and therefore would be consumed. Correct. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, good. Okay, so this is just a, a brief overview of how the grammar looks. I encourage anybody to look at the source code um, for which I haven't posted a link lately. But, uh, so to give a more, bit more background, the whole point of Jessica is to provide a Jesse environment and to implement the majority of that environment in Jesse itself. So all of these modules are written as Jesse modules. Um, I'll just pop over to the next thing. Uh, okay, so I'll just do a debug run and show you this. Uh, oh, where am I? What tool are we in? This is Visual Studio Code. Cool. Very good. 
Sorry, uh, Mike, can, can you put the link to the source code in the chat? Um, the chat gets saved with the, with the recording. Um, so if you post it to everyone, uh, it would be relevant. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's time uh, related as well. Uh, we, we would all have uh, reference to it in context, hopefully. Uh, sure. I would love to do that if I can figure out how to get to the chat while I'm presenting. <laughs> here it is up here. Okay, I think I found it. Yeah, we we are just pointing in in weird places because we don't see that thing that you're pointing at. So yeah, you yeah. Just look, yeah like you're chat. here. It is chat. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I'll keep the. I wanted to jump in with a correction. I I just checked and uh, multi line comment, if it contains an embedded line terminator, is uh, syntactically treated as a line terminator. It's wow. only when uh, okay. So, so basically, there's two different flavors of multi-line comment, so one which terminates, one which does not. It's probably best in Jesse just to reject comments uh, where no new line is expected. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. That, that stays within the subset, and it's not confusing. It also uh, follows along the path of some, uh, something that ECMAScript does. I think you've commented on this, Mark, where um, if, you, if you initially are strict and to the point of overbearing and disallow a lot of stuff as syntax errors, then later you can expand language and it won't be a problem. Yes. OK. Um, so having found the chat, let me try to collapse this little chat window. OK. So I did post in the chat the, the URL to the source code repository for Jessica. Um, the next thing I wanted to show was uh, just a brief demo of actually running Jessica. Uh, in the terminal. Here we go. So I have a test suite that I'll demonstrate later. But right now, if I run an N NPM uh, T, from the top of Jessica after doing my NPM install, then basically it builds the whole thing. And I, I don't know what NPM T is. NPM test. Ah, OK. So it, it will just run the test script as defined in my package.json. OK. It downloads a bunch of stuff, uh, runs the unit tests I have so far. Um, and then it runs JessPipe, which is the fundamental of, of Jessica. It's basically uh, uh, power delegating fr main front end to allow a uh, Jesse program to read files from a, that are specified on the command line. So this mm -hmm. first run uh, just runs the live emit.c or emit c, which I'll show here. Um, <laughs> and the second one explains that I don't have import implemented, so I can't. Yeah, run Jessica in Jessica. Um, so this is all that the first thing was. Um, I can't see here. OK. No. So I'm sorry, so it, it wrote a .c file? Yeah, so the emit main in uh, emit c .mjs basically just writes the output using the, the uh, endowments that are given just to main. So I write this fix me stub to the C file that I'm generating. Ah. And then the test suite said, OK, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, next thing I want to say. OK, so just to give you a sense of what the uh, TypeScript typings give me in VS Code and in any language that supports TypeScript language server, OK. Um, I can do CO. Oh, this is interesting. Why is this working? Oh, I didn't do it right. Let me try this again. I'm not in the TypeScript file. If I was in the TypeScript file, then I could do CO. And I do not get console. I do not get anything else. I could get WI gives me width. And about that, that's it. And. Uh, so I, I do have other typings. Is TypeScript include sloppy mode? Um, 
I have to see if there's a way of uh, fixing this in the TS Lint and the, the IDE. I focused essentially on the, the, uh, the APIs is because I found that it was easy to stay away from the bad stuff in the, in the expression syntax. But uh, the APIs were very confusing when I was trying to type stuff up. Okay. So, um, so your .ts file, so, okay, so your, your .mjs files themselves are actually written in Jesse. Mm -hmm. um, the mjs.ts files are written in a, are still written in Jesse or written in Jesse with TypeScript type annotations or I'm, yes. I'm confused. It's, they're written with TypeScript type annotations. So you see here with depths, I have a TypeScript annotation. Okay. And basically it'll tell me, uh, it provides the ID with uh, information as well as breaking the compile if you get the types wrong. Okay. So does your Jesse, do you have a Jesse grammar that includes the TypeScript type annotation grammar? No, I don't, and I probably never will. Um, the options that I picked for TypeScript are very simple. They're basically saying we're emitting to ES 2017, and uh, all the all the things like uh, the interps or the imports. This is the TypeScript file, or this is the TypeScript file here, and the the MJS file contains the identical import. So. Uh, this is interesting too. Uh, very interesting, actually. <laughs> uh, I have to look at the output some more. But a lot of these, uh, a lot of these emitted code are somewhat useless. So we're using a namespace, I believe. Uh, actually, it's a num, I think. Enumeration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Then you get binding dot stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, you're, so when you have a foo dot mjs and a foo dot mgs dot ts. It's the TS, which is the actual source that you manually wrote. Yeah. And the MJS without the TS is generated by TypeScript uh, expanding to non-TypeScript. Yes. And I, I check them both into version control. Okay. And when I do make changes to things, I tend to see what happened, what changed in the MJS file, just to make sure I'm still honest. Okay. Now, TypeScript, of course, is not trying trying to constrain itself yeah. to generating code only in the Jesse subset of JavaScript, of course. Yeah. Um, is it ne nevertheless the case that for these files, the MJS files that are generated by TypeScript happen to be in the Jesse subset? Uh, for the most part. Um, I'm not thoroughly convinced of that yes yet but when i do have the compilation working that's exactly when we'll see exact which constructs aren't in the jesse subset okay so. um could i uh, ask you two questions here sure um so you're running uh, tsc from the command line right that's correct um you're not having vs code auto um um whatever they call it in VS Code, uh, whenever you save a, a, an MJS.TS. Um, that's one option. Um, the other, there are two more options I wonder if you explored or want to explore. Um, you could uh, write a, um, a plugin style um, a, a compiler, which is like TSC, but it just it allows you to pass a uh, um, a custom compiler plugin. Um, so, although TypeScript command line arguments do not allow you to have plugins, uh, if you wrap the same basic structure, you're able to pass plugins as if you're passing them to the language server. Yes, that, that's uh, exactly that is one of the things on my infinite to do list. Yeah, the could, 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 uh, could you could you both of you go over that again? So just to explain, what, what Salah is talking about is when you use the TypeScript compiler API from another JavaScript program, you can control a lot more about what the compiler outputs and what it parses as success. Ah. So I do intend to eventually make a type, uh, Jesse limited TypeScript compiler mm -hmm. that would be a front end for the TypeScript API. 
So. Yeah, this, the second um, um, alternative to that, which I found very, very useful, are one of two paths. Either you use Rollup and compile um, uh, separate modules or in, uh, independent modules as, a, as one of the options of TypeScript. Uh, that allows you to save to .mjs without the JS extension havoc of renaming everything. Um, or you could use uh, Sucrase, I think, um, but that requires a lot of um, um, tempering because, uh, um, you know, so Sucrase is basically a... Sorry, how do you spell that? It's like, um, it's like Sucrose, but Sucrase, like Sucrose, okay. yeah. Yeah, they keep, you know, spinning off names. And so, so it basically is a, a compiler that compiles using other compilers. So it uses Babel, it uses TypeScript, it uses any of the popular ones. Um, and it really just limits to a very, very uh, limited subset of um, transformations um, to minimize the, um, you know, uh, wasteful uh, rewrite of code that, that, you know, is completely outdated, I guess. Uh, yeah, I would love to explore that more with you, Saha. If we could continue our discussions on uh, on email, that would be fantastic. Definitely. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, um, but essentially, all I'm using TypeScript for is uh, like a, a front end processor, so that I can make less mistakes. Um, okay. So uh, let, let let me raise a hypothesis. Sure. Um, uh, uh, we know that TypeScript is not sound for mm -hmm. JavaScript in the sense that a TypeScript program that TypeScript has says has no type errors can still, when run, um, when the resulting program runs, what it can do at runtime can violate the declared types. And um, you're fine with setting any, you're using any all over the place too, to completely bypass type checking. So the, uh, hi the question, the hypothesis, is that uh, um, the superset of Jesse that is a, also a subset of TypeScript that, that kind of corresponds to the um, Jesse, you know, the, the, the subset of JavaScript concepts which are present in Jesse, that um, if TypeScript says that that program has no type errors, uh, the hypothesis is that Jesse is, su is sufficiently restricted and, and structured um, you know, disciplined or something, that the TypeScript typing of that Jesse subset of TypeScript would actually be sound. Um, so I have no idea if that's true, but it would be a wonderful property if it was true. Um, because of any, you can type something that just passes everything in TypeScript. And so it's hard to say that any can ever be sound because <laughs> it's, you're not defining a type for something. So you're saying to the TypeScript compiler, it's OK. And what Jesse actually parses, uh, it has very little to do with TypeScript types and more to do with the dynamic types that are actually happening. OK. OK, so it sounds like we can uh, pretty definitively say that this hypothesis is false. Uh, in my experience, yeah. OK. Okay. Good. Uh, what TypeScript does do for me is when there are very complex areas of the code with which use a lot of interfaces, and especially in bootstrapping stuff like the peg parser, um, it allows me to say I do want to type this code and I want to find a type that is sufficient for everything, and then that region of code at least is a bit better. So. Um, okay. So. This is the evaluator. Uh, I'll be changing this now that I know that Enum expands to something weird. I'll just use some, some contents, constants. But essentially, what I have is a, a, a binding that defines a getter and a setter for a name. 
And this is very scheme-like. We just have a parent of the binding, which is another binding or undefined. And uh, we can create bindings and there's a, when we actually evaluate a variable, we just walk up the current context bindings in its environment pointer. So uh, this is kind of how it looks. I, I think the most interesting part is down here where we have different kinds of actions for the context. We're basically saying this is the context, the evaluation context that the current context is in. And we say the actions that are, that are viable in that context. So when we pass to do eval something that is the module actions and the only thing it can evaluate is a module. And that comes directly from what is parsed. Um, right now, uh, this interpreter is just ad hoc. It's whatever I feel like doing right now. Um, I intend to make that much more systematic and actually walk through all the grammars and make sure I've handled all the productions correctly. Okay. But I haven't done that yet. Okay. So this, it, so, so what we're seeing is a start on a meta interpreter of Jesse in Jesse. Um, uh, or you know, technically in the TypeScript that should expand to Jesse, mm -hmm. uh, but where the uh, representation of the program being interpreted is the AST representation that the grammar we were looking at produces. Precisely, yeah. Okay. Um, so, Something that uh, Mark and I just worked out over the last day or so was the idea that object iteration uh, and specifically computed lookups of string keys should be allowed, but computed mu mutation is not allowed. Um, so I have some relics of old code here where I'm basically passing around object.entries as my endowment for something that needs to walk an object. Because but it was not on the whitelist, right? Yeah, exactly. But now object.entries, keys, and values are all on the whitelist. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so I'll go back to the test suite, which is written in TypeScript, and it doesn't need to be compiled because I use a version of Jest that supports uh, TypeScript directly. So I don't know why that's saying that disable. Let's try this. Oh, right. This is disabled. So this is what I'm currently working on is uh, the so, so I can create a Jesse tag by stacking up the, the pegs, the Jason and the Justins. And tag string is something that allows me to run it on just an individual string rather than something with holes. Um, but this is what I'm exploring is why my parser isn't parsing foo one equals one, two, three. This is the test fail that's currently failing. Um, so there's something in there, in the layers and layers of parsers that is not allowing me to assign things in the function body. Quick question. Uh, you mentioned holes. Um, hmm. And it, it, it is uh, relevant in this context and maybe you can explain holes because I thought I understood it, but I don't think I do. Okay, so a hole in a tag. Uh, let me go to something where I have syntax again. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. Um, so a tagged template is JSON tag followed by a, a, a backtick or quasi quote. Yeah, and this is just ABC. Oh, a span like a like a template span. Yeah. Oh, and a hole is just one of these. So that yeah. one is in a hole. And and you treat those as in you have the main template and you update. Um, you create the copy by filling in the holes, basically. Yes, that's what the the tag string does. Yeah, yeah. So the the parser tags otherwise can identify holes in their parse. Mm -hmm. So they get either characters or they have some semantic, uh, some predicates that allow them to detect a hole or to, de to detect um, basically any kind of uh, 
any kind of action you want to do on the parse stream, you can implement. Well, the, the, the whole, I mean, in the quasi in the quasi parser generator, the whole was a, a, a you know primitive token type in the same way that a character is, but it was distinct from a character. I assume you're doing the same thing? Uh, I'm actually, this is how I do it in quasi-peg. So I have, uh, up here, I have, in the peg tag, I have a whole member, and whole is basically a, a predicate. So it, it takes the current state of the parser and tells whether it passed or failed. Um, so, my definition for a hole in the peg grammar is to say, if it matches that predicate, it's a hole. That's what the ampersand semantic. I, I'm, I'm not understanding this. So ampersand followed by something is a positive look ahead. Okay. So we're saying ampersand followed by the whole predicate, which is... And what does the whole predicate test? Uh, I can show you in the root peg. Um, okay. So it looks like this. Uh, we basically have find, which gives us a character or a, a number based on the position that we're currently at. And if it's a number, then it's the number of the whole. Okay. Okay. So there's no there's no way for this to mistake um, characters for holes or vice versa. No. Okay. Great. Does that look like a picture inside a picture inside a picture kind of thing? <laughs> because I, I feel like that in my head right now. <laughs> yeah. There. There. The infinite regress is avoided. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's just inception. <laughs> That's yeah. right. And, and, and it's having that effect. Thank you. So <laughs> it's in my head. Good... <laughs> Here, here's something that helps explain how all this is done. Is uh, this peg, peg AST is actually the abstract, abstract syntax tree that you get from parsing the make peg grammar. Uh, this one here. And where's the hole in that? There's no hole in that, right? There's no hole in, oh, there are holes in this one, actually. I should show you. <laughs> in the NP itself, right? Uh, so, yeah, I want to get rid of this. Where can I move this? Can I slide this? Yeah, I can slide this somewhere else. No, I don't know how. The tab itself. Yeah, no. okay. Yeah. Um, so, what I was showing was, in the quasi-peg grammar, we do have holes. These are the semantic actions and some of the predicates that we use too in the quasi-peg grammar. Okay. So here, an example is the grammar definition itself. So I'll show you the peg AST. And this has a grammar with an action that specifies a hole as its second argument, followed by spacing the, the zeroth hole followed by the spacing and the end of file definitions. Thank you. Like I, you, you made it clear. It just made me feel a lot dumber. So, but thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so in all this box folding, one of the things we do is we combine the template with the semantic actions and put that all together before we compile them up. So when you first run the grammar, all you get is the AST, which specify the holes as numbers, but you also get an array of uh, the actual expressions corresponding to those holes, which are the, uh, the rest right. arguments, right? Right. So then when you encounter hole zero in your, in your AST, then you just have to look up in that array of, of of expressions, what corresponds to zero. Are you doing the same kind of, um, of, of memoizing that I was doing in the quasi parser generator? Yep. That you uh, generate the grammar from the AST of the grammar without looking at the semantic action values uh, so that you can reuse 
the same generated grammar over multiple different semantic action values. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll just pop back to the unit tests. Um, what I wanted to show off was, uh, for a given unit test, I can just experiment with stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to say that the, uh, the Node.js language separation from the library directory, the lib directory is where we were looking at most of the sources, which are the just pure Jesse sources. Um, or the TypeScript then converted to pure Jesse sources. Uh, in the, the Node.js directory, I have more tools that help me with development, but are, can only be run under Node.js. So the intent is to have the lib directory completely independent from Node. And uh, in the tools direct, or in the languages directory, I can do things like use Jest and do, do the right thing here. So one of the things that I could do here is I have a reference types and I import a global environment and stuff for these tests. So I have access to the, the Jesse uh, subset as well as all the stuff that I would get from just plain node. Now one open question that I have not solved yet is how do I get to use SES as the host in the Node.js environment? And uh, this is difficult without an implementation of import. Right, right. Um, yes. Yeah, which is, you know, which is the, you know, the central topic that this group has been, um, you know, focused on, which is how do we get from SES as it exists right now to an SES that also supports uh, least authority modules with, right. um, with import and export. Precisely. So that's very germane to my problem here. Yeah. For now, I'm just uh, relying on the TypeScript typings to help keep me in the right subset. Yeah. And uh, when I have the compiler actually written, then it will re reveal all the ways in which I cheated. And then um, from there, well, hopefully we get to the SES environment before that point. Because okay. it would be really nice to have it in, debug in debugging. Now, uh, since all of this is written in Jesse, Jesse does not have resource modules. Correct. Uh, and therefore doesn't need the mechanisms um, uh, like the manifest, like, uh, you know, like various other, th you know, like the, like the support for separate compartments and linking between different loaders, all of which are motivated to support resource modules. Uh, uh, all of these things should be pure modules. Uh, do you believe that they all are pure modules? Except for the bootstrap, yes. Except for the bootstrap, okay. Um, and um, so one of the, so, so since this is all in just Jesse with pure modules and it's a meta interpreter, one possible direction of bootstrapping is that this becomes an interpreter of Jesse with pure modules that's written in Jesse without modules. Yes. That's actually what my test suite is, is trying to exercise when it actually starts to work. Okay. Um, I'll show you here. Uh, tech. So the first thing that it does is it runs this Jest pipe, which is my initial authority against the emitter and the library files. Um, the second thing it does is it runs Jest pipe against main Jest pipe that MJS, which is the meta interpreted main program, which only takes a few extra endowments. And then it runs that against the emitter against the library. So when I have import working within Jessica, this will actually be somewhat proof that it can parse itself. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, is Dayon still on? It looks like Dayon dropped off. Uh, yeah, I think he dropped off. Um, 
I, I have a, um, a work in progress module system, um, Polyfill, um, which works in all the browsers and in Node, a common JS and ESM. Um, and I'm, I'm looking for a good um, cause or a good, you know, driving cause to actually work on it further. Um, would that be a good, um, so, so it, it doesn't implement all the uh, hard, you know, rough corners of, of ESM, uh, but it does implement uh, bindings based, um, um, you know, um, deferred uh, evaluation. Um, it does support uh, a, at, at this point, I, I, I uh, use template strings to wrap my import and export statements because it doesn't run with the syntax itself. It actually looks for those and it does the bindings to uh, like, kind of like a dynamic namespace, a very, very early prototype of it. Um, would that be a suitable thing to use if there's a way to create, um, you know, shims of modules? Would would that still be a valid, and as a first step, maybe? Um, I I actually don't want to take any step away from Node.js until I can have an import module or an import implementation written in Jesse that only supports export default. Oh yeah, that that's easy. Like if if, um, if I can you know strip out just the export default behavior and you're importing default, um, I'm pretty sure it uh, you know um, it's a good enough reason for me to uh, to go into the code and, and you know try to make it make make more sense. Like right now, I made it work um, to test a lot of different scenarios like name bindings. Uh, but if you're just focusing on defaults, I'm pretty sure we can we can uh, refine that into a very very limited subset. For that would Jesse. be terrific. Yeah. All right. So um, I guess we can coordinate on this after the meeting. Uh, yeah, we'll create an issue for it or something in the repository. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So yeah. Let, let the last me, thing I want. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, since we're recording, let me just uh, mention the question for Dayon for me to to point him at later. Um, uh, which is uh, dayon has been working on the uh, purity checking rules, um, uh, starting from the um, you know the the stuff that Kate and I wrote down in the appendix of the safe module document. Um, the uh, uh, since Jesse modules must uh, all be um, must all obey those rules. Uh, and we had, and um, then at some point, part of the meta interpretive uh, implementation of Jesse would be the subset of those purity checking rules that are applicable to Jesse. Uh, I'm not sure how much of a simplification that is, but Jesse is a small subset of SES, so potentially there is, you know, there's some simplification if we just try to implement the purity checking rules for Jesse. Uh, and in any case, uh, the issue of soundness should be an easier one to examine in the context of Jesse than it is in the context of full SES. As to whether the purity checking rules under the assumptions actually result in the pure, the pure value guarantees of the exports for modules that we hope that they result in. Yeah. Um, yes, I think it's getting close to the point where contributions from other people would be greatly appreciated. And uh, this, to emphasize, this is only one implementation of Jesse, so I don't want to do anything that uh, gives a more uh, advantageous environment to me, but maybe compromises the other people who are trying to write Jesse interpreters. So uh, it would be really great if we could separate these things out into different modules that could be used by other people too.
um, yeah, so that's really all I wanted to show for today. Uh, when I have import, and uh, Salah, your, your work is greatly appreciated. It's very, it comes at a very good time for me. Um, I guess yours too, so uh, it's a, yeah. a good collaboration opportunity. The Thank Canadians you. will take over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming. Just <laughs> when I was at Google, we always laughed at about about all the Canadians in Google that were plotting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, all right. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks, Mark. I think that's all I had. I'd be happy to field any questions, uh, but I want to give some time to the rest of the meeting if need be. Okay. Um, so anybody else who um, uh, wants to raise uh, something, um, now's a good time. I don't have anything for, uh, for any of this work. Um, I did have an idea that I threw on the SES strategy mailing list last night. Oh, yeah. Um, the um, uh, the Invariant. Handler, the proxy handler that does the invariant checking. Right. Yeah. Um, I had a couple more thoughts since I sent that email out. Uh, one was it shouldn't be reflect.invariant, it should be proxy.invariant. And second, we would need to pass in, we would need to specify arguments on each of the uh, handlers for the return values we intend to check. So it would no longer be a handler. Technically, it never it never was. Okay, okay. It would really just be a handler checker or something with with its own unique API. Yeah, slightly up, slightly as as close as possible to the Reflect API. I'm sorry, the proxy handler API, but it has to have handling for arguments. Okay. I, I'm sorry for the return value. But other than that, I mean, I was thinking, you know what? The engines already implement this. Um, it, it'd just be nice to have it available as an API I could call directly so that I wouldn't have to uh, guess where I went wrong. Mm -hmm. So is, is this something that you could shim pretty easily? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and once shimmed, then it could be used for the purposes you have in mind. Okay. But then would that, would that be an argument against putting it in, in the specification? Uh, it might be. It depends on uh, uh, how good the shim is. If the shim is, is uh, you know, small, straightforward, and has no real disadvantages over putting it in the platform, then yes, it would be an argument against putting it in the platform. But that's a victory, not a problem. I would, I would think the one reason would be code reuse within the within the ECMAScript engine itself, within the implementer's engines. But I, I mean, I, it, it's just an idea. I'm not that sold on it. I just wanted to throw it out there and see if it would stick. Uh, so I would say um, if it makes it easier for other people developing handlers to debug their development of handlers because, as you said, they get a in-stack rather than out-of-stack indication that there's a problem. Um, uh, that certainly would help the debugging experience. So I think as a development tool, at least, uh, it's probably worth providing, I think, as something for the platforms to support. And I think it probably, my guess is it probably isn't, but I'll reserve judgment until I see what it looks like as a shim. Uh, but obviously, if it doesn't need to go into the platform, it also does not need to become a proposal. It can just be a library. Right. Well, I can write it up. Uh, again, I'd, I'd written up a sample of it based on what Mozilla had done. And it turns out that what they had done, including their error messages, was based not just on the spec, but the error messages were identical to what Tom Van Cutsen wrote in his uh, reflected implementation. I'm sorry, his mm -hmm. proxy hat implementation. So basically, it's just porting those uh, those invariants into a library. And I've already done that in one sense. I just haven't fully tested it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, so I think just, you know, uh, having that be a library that other people can, uh, you know, can smoothly use is a nice way to help other people write uh, proxy handlers. Uh, going back to uh, relating this back to uh, Jesse, um, because proxy is a difficult thing to implement when you're just trying to do a simple meta interpreter for Jesse, um, uh, proxy itself is not on the Jesse whitelist, uh, so that a standalone Jesse implementation uh, does not need to implement proxy. But the purpose, uh, you know, the primary purpose, and especially the purpose from a security point of view of proxy and weak map uh, was to support membranes. Uh, so um, as I've separately discussed uh, with Alex, um, one, one thing I do intend to make available um, uh, to Jesse is a membrane library that is meaningful for Jesse. And because Jesse doesn't have mutable, generally mutable properties or extensible objects and doesn't really have any um, uh, full-fledged concept of inheritance, a, um, a membrane library that is adequate for Jesse should be a fairly simple thing. That's the hope. That's 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 not a not a fully baked idea at this point. I had one quick question in regards to the libraries you want to provide to Jesse. Um, what are you intending for crypto? Uh, I did notice that uh, I was talking with Ty from the Tink project, and he's made available some JavaScript code that they're using internally um, that will become part of Tink one point four once they get the build system to work. What is Tink? Tink is a uh, continuation of Keysar, which uh, is basically crypto APIs that are hard to misuse. So I have not looked at either one. Um, the, uh, obviously, uh, for, the, for the purposes that we're looking at at Agoric, uh, being able to um, make use of crypto from JavaScript is, is essential um, for our larger plans, but there's some constraints on how we want to go about that. Um, uh, so um, the For a variety of reasons, I want to keep cryptographic secrets quarantined mm -hmm. um, so that um, uh, the JavaScript code can um, effectively talk about cryptographic operations where any use of cryptographic secrets happens somewhere else. That, that meshes very well with how Tink handles key sets. Okay. Which essentially opaque handles that you can pass around. Excellent. Yeah. Um, regarding uh, implementing a membrane for Jesse, uh, Mark, I know you came up with the concept, but I still claim that it is never simple to implement a membrane. The, um, so once we get into uh, dis parameterizing membranes with distortions, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're correct. With respect to the basic core membrane for Jesse, what I'm thinking let me, let me, so let me state the hypothesis and you can tell me where I might be going wrong, uh, is that 
because Jesse objects are, um, their properties are not mutable and the objects are not extensible, that um, the, to, to create effectively a proxy for a Jesse object, you know, for a standalone Jesse implementation where there is no, nothing other than Jesse, um, that uh, you can just create a regular, let's see, I'm thinking, I'm thinking this out as I'm stating it, so. Um, I was merely referring to the complexity of proxy handlers, and what you're telling me basically sounds like several of the traps would not be very complex. For instance, if it's not extensible, then um, is extensible can simply return false, as long as it maintains the invariance. Yeah, I'm actually, um, uh, maybe that is, what so, okay. So for implementing the proxy API in Jesse for Jesse, then, the proxy would not be a distinct kind of object. It would just be a regular object with accessors for each of the, for each of the properties on the target, uh, uh, which where the accessors just directly reflect onto the handler. Um, and I think that would implement the subset of the proxy API uh, applicable to Jesse. Um, so like I said, this is, this is very much a half-baked idea that I'm talking about in real time. Okay. <laughs> um, but do you, does, uh, does anybody see a flaw with that? I, I see a, a tiny one, but and it's one that, um, if you remember, I was talking about the uh, sealed cyclic problem that turned out not to be a problem, um, where you had accessor descriptors instead of data descriptors. Um, and it sounds like you're willing to pay that price. So in Jesse does not contain, Jesse itself does not have reflect on the whitelist. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and it also does not have a uh, get own property descriptor or get own property descriptors or define property on the whitelist. Um, so you actually, in a standalone Jesse implementation, you can't reflectively sense whether a property is an accessor property or a data property, I think. That's the hypothesis. This is still as I mean, I'm let me, let me think about that for a second. Okay. Um, you stated that they're not mutable, mutable, so that gets rid of define property and set and probably um, probably um, set prototype of. Yes. That's three of the thirteen. Um, you've defined. You've said that. Get on property descriptor is not available, which gets rid of that prop and get probably has as well. So get the get trap, the has trap, uh, I think I, I, you, I'm, I think I'm, you would, I think those would continue to be present. Okay, let me let me let me restate where I'm coming from. Okay. Uh, in term property descriptor, get on property descriptor and define property are the only ways that I am aware of off the top of my head to access those property descriptors. Yes. So that the, means if you're disallowing those, which you just stated, and your assertion that it doesn't matter whether it's an access to descriptor or a data descriptor is correct. Okay, great, great. So basically, uh, the, uh, I think maybe to put it in a more direct manner, the hypothesis is 
that a standalone Jesse implementation does not need the concept of a property descriptor. And I'm not qualified to determine one way or the other whether that's true, whether that hypothesis is true. Okay. Um, uh, so the idea would be that the target has a fixed set of named properties. Uh, Jesse also does not have symbols. Standalone Jesse does not have symbols. So you have a fixed set of named own properties that the proxy can just be an object that has the corresponding set of named accessor properties with getters and no setters where the, oh, oh, actually, no, with, um, well, let me come back to the setters. Maybe it does need setters because the underlying target, yeah, it does need setters because the underlying target can have accessor properties with, with getters and setters. Um, so, uh, and therefore the proxy would have a get trap, a set trap, and a has trap. Um, and, the proxy's accessors would just directly reflect into the handler, um, uh, uh, into the handler's get, get and set trap. Um, so I think, so that, that's basically, that's, that's what I'm thinking. It would, it would be that straightforward. Okay, a couple thoughts if I may. Um, one, I think you mean a map instead of a, of a vanilla object simply because some fool may define two strings as a property or two source. I'm, I'm speculating on that one. Um, you, you said an object for storing the properties by name. And I was thinking, no, you probably want to use a map. I, I am thinking an object because then the proxy is not a distinct type. It's just a normal object where you you where when you do the operations on the object, uh, it just gets reflected. I guess what I'm worried about are primitive names being overridden, and then not and then. Okay, that this is a detail that we can take offline. And frankly, okay. I'm not I'm not certain of it either. Okay. Okay. Um, the second thought I had was, from what I remember from the video. Uh, it looks like you can disable all the uh, pro all the prototype traps. Get pro excuse me. Get prototype of and set prototype of. Where mm -hmm. you don't yep. need those as well. Yeah. So I guess what I'm getting at, Mark, is in terms of documentation for Jesse, in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, proxy traps, it might help to enumerate the traps in in a quick um, in a quick uh, HTML list and say, okay, this trap is, is enabled for this reason. This trap is disabled for that reason. Yep. Yep. Just yeah, there's def definitely one where when we actually go to do this, we need to carefully document the rationale because it looks very, very different for a standalone Jesse than it does for a, a full CES. Right. And those are the only points I really had to raise there. Okay. Okay, I think um, if nobody else has anything, I think we can adjourn early. Okay, um, uh, let's adjourn. And uh, Sala, uh, why don't you communicate privately with me and Kate uh, afterwards with regard to uh, getting the recording up onto uh, YouTube as we discussed. Yeah, definitely. Great. All right. Okay. And so I'll let you terminate the meeting. Sure.